Greetings to you from Pastor Coleman of the First Baptist Church of Crestmont. We're so glad that you joined us this morning for our broadcast. We believe in the power of the Word of God. It's clarity, it's answers for life's questions. And so we know as you go into this broadcast, you will leave the broadcast better than when you came. In Jesus' name, amen. And get you the two, two new members. So I simply want to read in your hearing uh, verses 1 through 8 from Nehemiah chapter 2. Um, verses 11 through 13, we're going to look at verse 17. But I simply want to read verses 1 through 8 um, in your hearing, 1 through 8. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And the word of God reads thus, During the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence, so the king said to me, Why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but depression. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, May the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king with the queen seated beside him asked, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah and let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I live. The king granted my request, for I was graciously strengthened by my God. You may have, you'll see strength like no other. That could have been a title I tried to the text this morning, strength like no other amen amen but we're going to look at a good leader a good leader a good leader let us pray father god we bless your name we praise you honor you magnify you decrease us increase yourself give us the ears that are necessary to hear the hearts that are open to what thus saith the lord because we do not want to leave the same way we came in jesus name we ask for you to speak to your servants god who are going through the valley of the shadow of death who are climbing the rough side of the mountain we believe that this is a word for them and then god we pray for the person who's looking for a church home that we believe they found it here at first baptist and then, God, we pray for the person who's here in church but may not know you as the Christ, as the Lord and Savior. We pray that when this sermon is finished, that their heart is touched in such a way that they would give their life to you. But above all of it, God, we pray that you might get the glory. In Jesus' mighty matchless name, we do pray. And the people of God said a threefold amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. A good leader, a good leader. Uh, re the reality is that that all of us in here are leaders in some form, or some form or fashion. All of us are leaders in some capacity. And so, this word is not just for those who are in official positions of leadership, but this word is really for everybody in here because, in some form or fashion, you have influence over somebody else. And if you have influence, over somebody else that makes you a leader that makes you a leader so when we look at the characteristics of leadership or we look at what entails or what encompasses a good leader can I simply say that number one a good leader has to have passion somebody say passion nobody wants to follow somebody that's dull nobody wants to follow somebody that's boring nobody wants to follow somebody that does not have any enthusiasm if you're going to be a good leader you must have passion when you look at Nehemiah's story in chapter 1 when Nehemiah heard that his people were in great trouble when we, he heard that they were disgraced when he heard that the walls were broken down when he heard that the gates were burned down the Bible says that he wept that he mourned that he sat down that he fasted that he prayed that he cried out to the God of heaven because if you are going to be a good leader you have to have passion you have to have passion for people 
and you have to have passion for what you do. So when we talk about being a good leader, you have to have passion. And when you have a passion for what you do, understand that what you do always ultimately connects back to people. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever you are passionate about, it ultimately connects back to people. If you've been called or you have a passion to be a pastor, it's about serving the people of God. If you have a passion to be a politician, it's about serving the people that voted you into office. If you have a passion for being an airline pilot, it's about getting the people on your plane safely to your destination. If you have a call to be a mom or a dad, it's about your children. If you have a call to be a child, it's about your mother and your father. If you have a call to be a husband, it's about your wife. And if you have a call to be a wife, it's about your husband. Because whatever God has called you to do, ultimately, it's about people. So you had even Jesus, when it came to the earth, it was about people. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whatever God calls you to do, you have to be passionate about it. A good leader has passion. Passion for people and passion for what they do so much so if you're going to be a good leader the reason that you need passion is because there are times when you'll feel like quitting and because there are times you feel like quitting you need passion it's your passion that will keep you pushing on it's your passion that will keep you going on you remember jeremiah jeremiah 29 jeremiah was ready to quit preaching ready to quit the ministry but he said it's like a fire shut up in my bones i can't keep it to myself paul who was stoned more than once and left for dead several times said in reference to the gospel that I'm compelled to preach it. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. And in Acts 1 chapter 3 in your King James Version it talks about how it was Jesus' passion to go to the cross. See, passion will help you keep pushing even when folk leave you. Passion will keep you going even when you face injustice. Passion will keep you going even when folk lie on you. Passion will keep you going even when everybody does and like your passion will keep you going even when false witnesses rise up against your passion will keep you going on even when they beat you all night long passion will stop you from dying until you accomplish what God has called you to do if you are going to be a good leader you have to have passion because there are times when what you're doing, it'll start to sap your energy. There are times when you're dealing with difficult people because touch your neighbor and say, everybody don't like you. I know you like to think that everybody likes you and everybody loves you, but everybody doesn't like you. And there are times when you're leading and folk that even like you don't understand what you're trying to do. So there are times when folk become difficult. And when the task becomes difficult, when people become difficult, you have to have a passion that goes beyond people. You have to have a passion that goes beyond what you do. You have to have a passion for the Lord. So even if I feel like quitting what I'm doing, even if I feel like quitting people, guess what? I can't quit God. So if you are going to be a good leader, you have to have passion. You have to have passion. And then number two, somebody say number two. I'm trying to find some passionate people in here. Somebody say number two. All right, number two, number two. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to have courage. You have to have courage. Look, look in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah says, I was overwhelmed with fear. So if you're going to be a good leader, you have to have courage. And y'all know courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the faith to overcome your fear. You have to have courage. It has been said by more than one person that success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is courage that counts. Let me say that again. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is courage that counts. In other words, if you're going to stay successful, you you have to have the courage to continue to change. 
Because nobody remains successful doing the same thing over and over again. If you're going to be successful, you have to have the courage to stand up against your haters. Because if you're going to be successful, folk who see your success, there's some folk who going to hate on you. And you have to have the courage to stand up. You have to have courage to remain successful. Because that means you have to have the courage to change, the courage to maintain, the courage to stand against your, your haters. But then failure is not fatal because that means you have to have the courage to get back up again. Because there are times when your failure is going to be spectacular. There are times when you fail and everybody will know that you fail. And you've got to make the decision. Am I going to go and crawl away and live my life in a hole? Or am I going to get back up and start all over again? You have to have courage. The Bible says that a just man falls seven times but rises back up again. Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, that's takes courage you've got to have courage you've got to have courage and, and Nehemiah Nehemiah when he goes into the presence of the king the reason that he's afraid is because he's the cupbearer and y'all know that the cupbearer's job was to taste the king's wine and to taste the king's food to make sure that it wasn't poison so it did not behoove you to come into the king's presence with a sad look on your face because the king might suspect that an assassination attempt was underfoot. That's why when the king said, Nehemiah, why are you sad? He said, long little king. <laughs> because he understood that, he, that, that if he came into his presence sad, the king might have him executed because he could suspect that there was an assassination attempt of the foot. But then Nehemiah was afraid, not only because of that, not only because he was sad and he was risking his life in that vein, he was, he was, he was afraid because you were never supposed to come into the king's presence with a sad face. Because the law of the Medes and Persians said, whenever you came into the presence of the king, you were supposed to be joyful. And you were supposed to be joyful because of whose presence you were coming in. Can I take a sidebar for a minute? That, that if we catch the principle of that thing, that when you're in the presence of the king of kings, and you recognize whose presence that you're in, no matter what you're going through, there ought to be a joy that comes over you just to be in his presence, just to know who I'm coming in front of. Good God, when I'm in his presence, that means I can get some stuff answered. When I'm in his presence, that means I can get some strength. When I'm in his presence, I'm in the presence of somebody who can do something about my situation. Whenever you can get into the presence of God, and guess what? You can get into his presence every day because you have a thing called prayer. And that means that every time you go to God in prayer, there ought to be some joy. As a matter of fact, Christians ought to be the most joyful people because not only can you get in his presence, but his presence lives on the inside of you. So whenever you encounter a Christian, even though I'm sad, I still have joy. And so, and so one of the reasons that near two of the reasons that Nehemiah was afraid, he was afraid because you weren't supposed to be sad in the presence of the king. He was afraid because he was the cupbearer, and because he was sad, the king might have him executed. But then he was afraid because the king had already declared that the walls of Jerusalem couldn't be built. When you go to Ezra chapter 4, Ezra chapter 4, read it when you get home. Ezra chapter 4, the king made a decree because Jerusalem had rebelled against several kings that had come before him. He made a decree that the walls of Jerusalem could not be rebuilt unless he made a further decree. And when I looked at that, I shouted. And the reason that I shout it is because the laws of the Medes and Persians said that once a king made a decree, it was irrevocable. It was irreversible. All you got to do is read the book of Daniel. When a king made a decree, he couldn't even reverse his own decree. That's why when Daniel ended up in a lion's den, King Darius couldn't do anything about it because he could not reverse his own decree. When you run to the book of Esther, when the king made a decree that all all the Jews be exterminated he could not reverse his own decree but when I look at the book of Ezra and the king said the walls cannot be rebuilt unless I make a further decree I recognize that the providential hand of God 
was at work in this situation so that the king would not make a final decree. And all I'm trying to do is say to somebody, when, it, when I'm talking about being courageous, you've got to understand that God has already prepared the way. For you to be successful. I don't know who I'm preaching to in here. But see somebody in here. You're ready to quit. Because of who said no. You're ready to quit. Because of who you have to come in front of. You're ready to quit. Because you're looking at the obstacle. You're ready to quit. Because of how far you have to go. You're ready to quit. Because of who you have to leave behind. You're ready to quit. Because of what you have to leave behind. You're ready to quit. Because you think it's not going to work. But way back in another book. And way back in another chapter in your life. God has already prepared for you to be successful. God not only prepared the way, God not only prepared the way, but God prepared Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah was a cupbearer, y'all. That means he was risking his life on a daily basis on more than one occasion every time he had to taste the king's food he was risking his life see God will already prepare you on one level for another level God will prepare you to be courageous in one area so that you can be courageous in another area see God had already prepared the way God had already prepared Nehemiah and I don't know who I'm preaching to in here but God has already prepared you as a matter of fact if you take a look around where you are, you shouldn't even be where you are right now. Nehemiah shouldn't have been the cupbearer to the king. You've got to hear what I'm saying. These are people that are oppressed by the Medes and the Persians. And yet somebody that was under the king's foot, he had as his closest confidant. If anybody was going to assassinate the king, you would think it would be somebody that was a slave to the king. And when Nehemiah took a look at the fact that he shouldn't even be the cupbearer to Took a look at the fact that he shouldn't be in the palace. Took a look at the fact that the king didn't make a final decree. Took a look at the fact that God had already prepared him. Perhaps you are where you are for such a time. And God has set this whole thing up so that you won't quit. God has gave you the passion. God has gave you the position. God has made the way so that you won't quit. And I don't know why I'm preaching to here, but you ought to encourage your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you can't quit now. You can quit now. God has brought you too far. If you're going to be a good leader, you've got to be courageous. But then, but then, if you're going to be a good leader, good leaders always pray. <laughs> the majority of chapter one is a prayer. Good leaders always pray. And then when the king asked Nehemiah, what is your request? The Bible says that he prayed again. Good leaders always pray. Because if God called you to it, you've got to call on God to see you through it. Good leaders always pray. Nehemiah prayed in chapter 1, prayed in chapter 2, prayed in chapter 4, prayed in chapter 5, prayed in chapter 6, prayed in chapter 7, participated in a national prayer in chapter 9 and then prayed in chapter 13. I wish I could park right there because some of y'all who are bankrupt, you really need to pray. Bankrupt spiritually, bankrupt morally, bankrupt with no money in the bank. You need to pray. When you talk about a good leader, a good leader always pray. They pray before it happens. They pray during it happening. They pray after it happens and they pray when it's all over. Good leaders always pray. So if you're going to be a good leader, number one, you have to have passion. If you're going to be a good leader, number two, you have to have courage. If you're going to be a good leader, number three, uh, you need to pray. And then if you're going to be a good leader, you have to have a well thought out plan. You have to have a well thought out plan. See, some of us want to get to certain places, but we have not thought it out. And we have not laid out a detailed plan. When you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a well thought out plan. Why? Because he has spent four months in a conference call with God. 
from the month of Kislev, which is the month of December, to the month of Nisan, which is the month of April, uh, Nehemiah was in a conference call with God, having prayer with God. And the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Somebody needs to hear me. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Don't start your plan and then want to turn around and give it to the Lord. No, commit your works. That means commit the details of your plan to God and your plan will succeed. I'm in the text. When you look at Nehemiah's plan, Nehemiah, 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 Nehemiah has a place he wants to go. He tells the king, I want to go to the city. That's Jerusalem. So a good plan has a place. And then he has a purpose. He says, I'm going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem as a purpose. And then a good plan has a pace. That means it has a timeline. He gave a definitive time when this thing was going to end. A good plan has a protection because what he did was he set the plan up a hedge of protection around the plan to make sure the plan was going to be carried out and then a good plan has provision he asked for what he needed and if you're going to have a well thought out plan for your life if you're going to have a well thought out plan as a leader you need to know where you're going you need to know the place that you're going you need to have a purpose you need to have a timeline you need to set that thing up and you need to make sure you have what you need to get it done in other words you need a place you need a purpose you need a pace you need protection and you need provision and when you look at nehemiah's plan nehemiah had a well thought out plan and many of us fail as leaders because we make the agenda up the night before the meeting touch a neighbor and say he telling the truth if you are going to be, many of us know where we want to go, but we don't count the cost to get there. Many of us know where we want to go, but we don't know who we are right now. And you will never get to where you want to go unless you know where you are right now. You will never become what you want to be unless you can admit who you are right now. Because if you are falling short of where you want to go, that means you need to work on yourself right now so you can become who you want to be. That means if you understand where you are right now and you take an assessment and you know where you want to go but you're not quite there, that means that you have to work on yourself in the present to get to where you need to go let me get out your way it look like I'm boring y'all look a good leader good leader good leader a good leader there ain't, ain't no passion in this place <laughs> a good leader a good leader this is what a good leader does a good leader many times will go down to see about things himself the text says that Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem. A good leader sometimes has to go down and see about things his or her self. You can't always delegate everything. Now, now, I got to get at some balance. What it means is this, is that there are folk who will always want you to come. And you've got to learn how to have balance as a leader. You've got to know when to come and when to be absent. There is such a thing as the ministry of absence. You can't practice the ministry of absence unless you've been a presence. So here it is. A good leader will be a presence in order to guide the ministry or to guide whatever organization he or she is guiding. But then a good leader will practice absence because a good leader understands if you're really going to put into practice what I've taught you, I can't be pre Say amen, lights, amen. See, the problem is that many of us are too hands-on with some stuff. You've got to learn how to practice the ministry of absence because your ministry will never grow. Your kids will never grow. Your organization will never grow because how will they ever put into practice the principles that you put in them if you're always practicing? That's why God practices the ministry of absence in your life. 
Because God has been a presence enough for you to know what you ought to do in this particular situation that you're in right now. And God will practice the ministry of abstinence absence so that you can put into practice what he's taught you when he's been you you've been in his presence all right a good leader good leader a good leader comes down a good leader comes down a good leader comes down a good leader good leader under that a good leader good leader knows that they can't do it by themselves because the text says that he grabbed a few good men. He had a few good men. A leader knows they can't do it by themselves. Nehemiah knew he couldn't build a wall by himself. But Nehemiah had an expectation that there were going to be a people that God was going to send to help him accomplish what God had put in his spirit. A good leader knows that they need the help of other people. So a good leader enlists the help of other people. But a good leader also needs folk who are willing to help. They say in the text, in the text, they're willing to help Nehemiah because they saw the grace on Nehemiah's life. They're willing to help Nehemiah because they saw the providential hand of God moving in Nehemiah's life. It doesn't matter if you are trying to enlist help if you can't get help. And there are times when there are people who are sitting back waiting for you to build every wall. Now, how crazy would it have been for Nehemiah to show up and take every stone and build that wall by himself? And yet there are people who are gathered in the house of God who expect the pastor to do it by himself. And there are people who aren't doing anything and then sit back and wonder why stuff ain't getting done. And then the first person they'll point to is the pastor as if the pastor can do it all by himself. And who am I? Pre I'm preaching to the folk who not doing anything. I'm preaching to the folk who are just watching everybody else do everything and are not doing anything. You cannot complain about how long things are taking. You cannot complain about stuff that is not set right in place if all you're doing is sitting back and being a critic. And the indictment is this. If you see grace on the man or woman's life that God has called to lead you, if you see the providential hand of God moving in the church and bringing about miraculous things, then the indictment is now on you. It's not on the man or woman of God because God is showing his grace. God is showing his providential hand. And the question becomes, where are you going to help out? There is no way that the choir law shouldn't be full. There is no way that the audio video ministry should be asking for people to still help. There is no way that there shouldn't be more trustees. There is no way that there shouldn't be more ushers. There is no way that there shouldn't be more people helping out. The only reason it's not happening is because there are people who are saying, give me, but won't give back. When he arrived at Jerusalem, he enlisted the help of people. And guess what? They helped him. Amen. They helped him. They helped him. Because when you come down to see about things yourself, many times as a good leader, you've got to set the example in order to galvanize other people. And there are some things you can't give to other people. You have to do it yourself. I think I know somebody who saw that his people were in great trouble. I think I know somebody who saw that his people were in disgrace. I think I know somebody who saw that his people were broken. I think I know somebody who saw that his people were burnt out. I think I know somebody who saw that his people were harassed by the enemy. 
I think I know somebody who saw that they were disgraced by sin, troubled by the enemy, broken hearted, and he didn't delegate it to the archangel Michael. He didn't delegate it to the archangel Gabriel. But when he heard about his people that were in trouble, he came down to see about it himself. And when he came down to see about it and saw that it was true, saw that his people were harassed by sin, saw that his people were in great trouble, saw that his people were being harassed by the enemy, he took a old rugged cross, slung it on his back, climbed up a hill called Calvary, and died, died that you, that you, that he could be a very present help in your trouble, died so that he could take away your disgrace, died so that you would be protected from the enemy, but he didn't just die, he got up early, my God and your God, my Jesus and your Jesus, my Lord and your Lord, my Savior and and your savior when he saw that we were in trouble saw that we were harassed saw that the devil was having his way with us he died you know why because a good leader is willing to lay down his life for his people so if you're going to be a good leader if you're going to be a good leader good leader in your home Good leader to your wife, good leader to your husband, good leader to your children, good leader on your job, good leader in your church, good leader in your community. If you're going to be a good leader, you need to have some passion. Maybe folk aren't following you because you open up the me. Let us pray. Sovereign God, let us sing our opening hymn. Blessed assured. Maybe that's why nobody's following you because you don't have no passion. You ain't no passion. Got to have passion. You got to be courageous. There are times when it's not going to make sense. Nehemiah left a cushy job. It was a risky job, but it was a cushy job. He left it for a broken down, broke up people. You've got to have courage. You've got to be a person that prays. You just can't pray when you get here, but you've got to pray all the time. Got to be a person of prayer. You got to be a person that has a plan. And most of us are broke because we don't have a plan. You plan to charge the suit, but you ain't have a plan to pay it off. You had a plan and bought the car, but you didn't have a plan to make the monthly payments. You got to have a plan. Got to have a plan. And then you can't be so high up on your own horse that just because you've been voted in as the leader, that you don't come down and see about some things sometimes. And remember, you're not coming down to see about the thing. You're coming down to see about the people. And that means if you're going to be a good leader, you've got to lay down your life. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. Stop sitting around talking about how you're doing everything and nobody's doing nothing. Guess what? That's a part of your sacrifice. And sometimes you've got to be the one doing it so that somebody will see it and start to understand and say, look at our leader. Look at how much she's doing and we sitting back here letting her do everything. Let me go grab the other end of this table. Look how well our maintenance guy keeps the church clean. Let me stop stepping over that piece of paper in the aisle. Let me pick it up on my way out the door. I see how hard our choir is working and they're here for two services. But if I join, maybe there could be a choir for the first service and a choir for the second service so they don't have to be here both services. Look how hard my pastor is sweating and working. Maybe if we gave a little bit more and we could get a bigger sanctuary, we could go to one service so he don't have to be here from 7 in the morning to 1.30 in the afternoon and preach both services and sweat out two and three suits. Maybe if we had some folk who had an idea what sacrifice is. We would go past that 350, 375 plateau because folk will see good leadership 
happening in First Baptist Church of Crestmont and say, I need to become a leader as a father, a leader as a mother, a leader on my job. Let me join that church because I see there's good leadership. We open the doors of the church. Our God is a mighty God, and he gave us a mighty word this morning. And I know that you were strengthened through the power of the word and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is such a healer, such a deliverer, such a wonderful savior. And I know that you are inspired as a result of this sermon. If you'd like to reach out to the First Baptist Church of Crestmont, just to let me know and the church know uh, that you've been blessed by the message, please go to our website and you can find contact information on there just to send me an email and to let me and the church know that you're truly being blessed by the broadcast. We'd love to hear from you for just as God is encouraging you through our broadcast, we need to hear a word from you so that we can stay encouraged. So I look forward to hearing from from you soon, and I'll see you next week. God bless.